This summer, I found a monarch egg on the milkweed that I had planted along the side of my house uh, in the garden. I found two, uh, actually. I left the first caterpillar, who we named Queenie, uh, on the milkweed plant, figuring I would check in on her in her natural environment. And uh, Queenie lasted about a day. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, she was preyed upon by a wasp or uh, an earwig or any number of things that eat caterpillars. And uh, I was really bummed because I just, I just had been so looking forward to seeing her progress. And I decided not to chance losing any more caterpillars. And so I collected the other egg that I found and brought it uh, inside to rear in the safety of my own house. Uh, when that caterpillar egg hatched uh, into a very, very tiny, tiny caterpillar, uh, maybe about the size of a, of a comma, a comma and a half on your keyboard, like if you look at your computer keyboard, the size of the comma and, and half as much again is about how big they are when they hatch. Um, just a tiny thing, but we named her Judy. Uh, that's a name that my, my boys have named all caterpillars since they were young for reasons I've never been able to discern. And I shared her progress and bits of her uh, biology here on Instagram and was kind of blown away by the reaction people's reaction to Judy. So many people seemed invested in her. Uh, if she is a her, I don't know, but that's what, how we refer to her. And she came to mean a lot more than just uh, than, than just another caterpillar to me, too. We'll talk about that. But I was uh, mentioning Judy uh, with a friend uh, several days ago, and this friend of mine had mentioned that she had been to the Monarchs overwintering grounds in southwest uh, Mexico. And I was just blown away by this, and I wanted to know all about it. And she said, well, I wrote this essay for this collection of uh, women's travel writers. And she gave me the book, and I read it, and it's just a beautiful essay. And I think she's posted it up on her profile here on Instagram now. Um, so if you are not following uh, Mira Sub, M-E-E-R-A-S-U-B, you should follow her, and you can check out um, her pictures and that, that beautiful essay that she wrote. So Judy is uh, hopefully going to emerge from her chrysalis any day now. And even though we just did bugology, I thought it might be a time um, with Judy getting so close to immersion and, um, and having uh, met this friend who had been to the Mexican uh, overwintering grounds, I thought it was just the universe was telling me we needed to do not just bugology, but monarchology. And uh, I'm so excited to have my guest uh, with me here today. Uh, today's guest is Mira Subramanian. Uh, she's a wonderful environmental journalist. She's written a fantastic, uh, her most recent book, I guess, is called The River Runs Again about uh, environmental challenges in India. And unfortunately, the cover comes through in reverse here on Instagram. But uh, this, this was published in 2015. It's uh, so moving. Uh, like the best environmental journalists, uh, when you read Mira's words, you don't necessarily even have to think that you're a person that's interested in what she happens to be writing about. She she makes you invest invested in it. She leads you into the story and um, and uh, tells it in a way that you don't have to be a scientist to understand. So, uh, without further ado, I am going to uh, invite Mira in her first time live on Instagram. Uh, with somebody, so we'll see. We'll see how this goes. I know it's going to work. There she is. Hey, hey, Mira. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. I'm, I'm so glad to see you. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me. I mean, all things monarch. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You got the, the professional like. Um, AirPods and stuff, you know. Like, yeah, I feel yep. like you've got it going on. You got the Zoom yep. setup happening. Sort of, although light, you know, the light. I was depending on natural light, but you know how that works is like sort of, it's there and then it, it moves. The oh yeah, it's actually moving all of the time. <laughs> That's why we love it so much. <laughs> um, thanks for being here with me. Uh, I should say with us because I thought I would just bring out uh, a status update here. I've got Judy right here. <gasps> 
Yes, he is. He's doing all right. There's all those right. spots. Those spots. But those spots, they change color when they're just about to do their thing. Is there any chance it's happening? Will it happen right now in the next 35 minutes? I mean, if it does, that would be amazing. <laughs> I'm going to put her back in her case so that if it does, I don't have to worry about her getting loose <laughs> in my living room here in my parlor. Um, let me just do this and be careful with it. There we go. All right. Yeah, so that was that was the thing that kind of made me think we needed to do monarchology is that you know she had reached this kind of penultimate stage of her life here, and then talking with you about how you've been, how do you pronounce that province in uh, that Mich state? Yeah, it's Michoacan. Michoacan. Okay, Michoacan. wonderful. And when did you go there? I'm pretty sure it was 2006. Okay. Yeah, it was right soon after I had, I was either like just finishing graduate school, I was in New York um, in grad school. And so that's what led me to to the story. Being a journalist is amazing because one story just leads to the next. And so that's that's how I came across it. Was well, that, doing a, I was doing a story on green roofs. And then I learned about someone who was like making milkweed habitat on tops of buildings in Staten Island, you know, on Staten Island. And I was like, so cool. why do the monarchs come through here? <laughs> and that was that was the start. Wait, so are you telling me that everything is actually connected to everything else in this world? That we are interdependent and interconnected beings? Is that Yep. That's wow. the takeaway. We can just Mind we can blown. just we can just stop there because that's that's, <laughs> that's the takeaway. <laughs> I know, man. I should have, if I were Terry Gross, I would have like stalled that conclusion and we would have wrapped up there. Um, we then we've begun with the ending. But, um, well, that, that was one of my questions about being an environmental journalist, because it's like, I wondered, are you just into all these different things and then you have to find ways to convince people to pay you to go investigate them? Or do people pitch you on the ideas? Like, or is it a mix of, of all that? Like, how does it work? Yeah, it's it's a mix. I mean, definitely when I was a grad student, I was running around just um, begging anybody. I mean, I ended up spending a lot of time and my own resources to follow the butterflies. And I think the end result in terms of a paid piece was a 400 word piece in Audubon magazine. I think that was the extent of my, you know, I probably got about $122 or something. Um, but so it's, so, uh, you know, at that point, but then I, but then I just, you just keep writing, you know, you write because you can't write, you can't not write. So um, that's where the essay ended up going and, and that went into to best women's travel writing plug oh, for this amazing right. series um, that I've been honored to be in a few times, but it, it just carries on year after year and it's really uh, got some great writing in it. Um, so you find a place for those stories, but generally it's a mixture of me being sort of obsessed about things and pursuing them. And then sometimes editors reaching out to me, but I definitely like the ones that I'm more obsessed about better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I imagine it's got to be a little bit like music in the way that whoever um, happens to be living with you says, Oh my God, will you just stop talking about this and do it already? You get this, this kind of idea, this, this obsession that you, you need to realize and whoever's with you just says, please, you're intolerable to be around. If, if you don't do this, there's going to be a problem. And so you go and do it and you get it out of your system. That's it. Or, <laughs> or you don't, and it morphs into something else, which is also great, you know? Like a caterpillar into a butterfly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. That's wild. So you went, how long were you in um, Mishwakan? I, I think I was down there for maybe a, a week, a week to two weeks, I think it was. Yeah. And yeah, uh, was, if anyone's yeah. just joining us now, um, after this, they can go to your Instagram profile, uh, Mira Sub, and uh, you post. Did you post the whole essay? I didn't. It's just snippets, so you, <laughs> you gotta <laughs> run out and buy the book to yeah, yeah, see the whole absolutely. thing. It's actually not even online, I don't think. No, no, I, I tried to find it and had to borrow <laughs> your copy, but uh, <laughs> there's wonderful pictures that aren't included in the book that uh, that are on your profile now. It's yeah, just, it's really cool, and there's no way to, to to really know how many monarchs you're looking at there, is it? Is there? No, and there's there's no way to know, and it, it's really, I mean, it's tr tricky to study insects, right? You probably talked about this in biology of like that they are a highly fluctuating, you know, all species of insects, their populations go up and down. So the the way that we can like count that there are 400 and so many um, right whales right now, like 
to the dot is mm -hmm. makes it kind of easy to have that metrics like oh we're doing bad we're doing well we're doing poorly but insects go up and down for all these different reasons so it makes it really tricky and count and standing there in that forest like looking at how many it was just unfathomable that you would ever be able to quantify that coupled with that they're insects so their populations go up and down but they are really threatened for all these so many reasons so many reasons yeah, so let's run through some of those. So I guess maybe we should take a step back because I take for granted that people know all this stuff and maybe they don't. But basically, just the kind of oversimplified Cliff Notes version of the monarch butterfly life cycle is um, they overwinter as adults in Mexico, most of them in Mexico, not all of them, but, um, but a lot of them in Mexico in this one area. Uh, up, is it up in the mountains? Yeah, it's up in the mountains. And on these, uh, is it Oyamel fir trees? Is that yeah. Uh, yeah. And and so they they last through the winter. Most butterflies um, overwinter as an egg or uh, some as a as a pupa stage. Um, so overwintering as an adult is is actually um, somewhat rare, as I understand it. But in the spring, when things start to get warmer, those monarchs in Mexico move north into Texas and the southern states. And uh, they uh, mate and lay their first uh, egg, and that egg hatches and turns into a butterfly and flies north, where it repeats the process, mating and laying another egg. And they do this kind of, it's not leapfrogging because they don't overlap, but they it's just this sequential kind of stepping of generations um, further north and spreading out across uh, the United States, and even into Canada by uh, the fourth generation. So... As I understand it, the monarchs that I see here in Massachusetts, or that we would see on the Cape, uh, where you are, are the great great grandchildren of the uh, the overwintering monarchs in Mexico. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. It's like four, three to three to five generations, I think. That yeah. They can take yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's this amazing thing. So every every generation, except for this final one. Um, or that fourth one, say, if you want to call that the final one. Every generation they mate, uh, like most butterflies or moths do, they mate and they die. And they've passed their genes on to the next generation and they are done. But uh, this final generation of the monarchs, these great-great-grandchildren, they go into something called, uh, I think they call it sexual diapause or something like that, where they, they kind of pause in their, in their sexual development and they fly all the way back to Mexico for the winter. And then they become that generation that then the next the following year um, moves up into the southern United States. And you can say all that and not fully appreciate that the cyclical nature of it and that those great great grandchildren have never been to Mexico. Mm -hmm. It's like me being able to go to Italy and find my great great grandfather's you know, village that I've never even met and I've never even been there. Yeah. Uh, and it's like I can do it basically just kind of by flapping my arms and drinking a little bit of sugar water along the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally amazing. I mean, it's just, it's just, a, yeah, it's really miraculous. Yeah. And do you know how long that, someone's asking how long that, does that flight back to Mexico take? Do you know? Um, I think it's about three weeks. Okay. Wow. Don't quote me on any of these numbers because it, it's been a long time since I've really dived into this, but I, I feel yeah. like it's about three weeks. Like they're heading down, the ones you see heading now. And this is like when you tune into this world, if you want, if you start looking for them, you know, right now you'll see that they're all, if you look up and you see one moving, it's moving south. You know, you see that, um, you know, when I really got into this, I remember being in like Prospect Park in Brooklyn, just lying on my back and it was like a river, you know, and every single one that passed is they're all going in the same direction. So it's just, yeah. Like, I mean, it's such a, uh, it is the word miracle is overused, but man, this, I think it yeah. lies here. And, uh, and of course, you know, they might get blown off course or they might, uh, they're not so much, I don't know if they're the adults are, are preyed upon so much because as I understand that they're kind of poisonous and they're, they have this, this, uh, warning coloration that kind of, you know, lets people, uh, lets, a uh, not people, but birds and stuff, not now not to eat them. Um, but there's, you know, there's yeah. pesticides. If people are, are, uh, are putting pesticides or insecticides uh, on their 
properties or on their farms and they happen to stop and, and try to nectar on a flower that has you know, this poison on it. Um, that can be a problem. Um, or, you know, maybe there's just storms or winds that blow them off course. I mean, I, I'm not sure we fully understand how they find their way down there, right? It's like, I think they think that it's, if I'm remembering correctly, it's, I think it's magnetism. Like they actually like orient, um, uh, through tuning into the, the, the magnetic alignment of the planet. I mean, it's, there were, there was, um, again, don't quote me on these details, but I'm, I'm remembering that there was a, like all of these butterflies show up in this one forest, right. In this one area in very rural Mexico. And so, um, there were um, a, a pair, I think their name were the Urquarts, who uh, a husband and wife couple in back yeah. in the 60s, right? Who were like trying to figure out where they, they knew they were all heading south, but they had no idea where they were going. And like, now we can just put it out on Instagram and yeah. take a picture of one and ask like if anybody else has seen them and we like crowdsource that information. And these, this couple were like totally obsessed, right? De- I think it took them decades yeah. to like send postcards to places in Mexico and just keep sending them farther south. Like, Hey, anybody seen this orange and black butterfly? If so, let me know. And, uh, Oh my God. Do you know the story? I feel like I, a little I, bit. I, I think they also had this program where they got, um, kind of civilian and amateur environmentalists and biologists to, to kind of, um, number them. They might've even affixed tags to them and yeah. then people would find them along the way and send the tag number back. And could they kind of pieced it together? Um, in part through through that, it's it's fascinating. I mean, this would have been less than eighty years ago that we figured out this was happening. And yeah, was happening for. But but by we 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 mean like the researchers. It was kind of hilarious that all the people like locally are just like yeah, like this is where they come. We have always we've always our people have always known that, and that's what the it's an indigenous area. And that's where yeah. they um, they've always known it, and now it is like. A mecca for nature tourists and I mean, researchers it's, and it's it's interesting though because you can flip it around too like did they did the indigenous folks know where the butterflies went they weren't there they well they their traditional belief is that they're the souls of the dead so oh, i don't know if they were as concerned about worrying yeah. geographically where they were going <laughs> yeah they um, worry about the i don't know if that's Florida. speculation i don't know but <laughs> um, but yeah but those the, that couple the urquarts were doing all these like crazy experiments trying to figure out how they made the journey like they would um you know they would like tie them with string like little strings on them and try to see which ways they, they would go they would like put them in boxes that would mess up their magnetism so that they would lose their orientation to see if that affected it. So they did, did all these, you know, they tried to figure out if it was smell, but all like homeschool DIY forms of research. Right. Yeah, yeah. I was reading about this today because I wanted to get a better handle on it. And, you know, there was one hypothesis that they navigated by the angle of the sun to the horizon. Oh, right, right. And, um, and then they realized that, you know, if all these monarchs coming from different areas, if they all use the angle of the sun, they wouldn't all be funneled to this kind of same place. So there had to be something yeah. else. And then they came up with this magnetic compass. And there's there's some research that found that there's this interaction between the sunlight and the magnetic compass. So oh, really? that when uh, uh, on cloudy days, they were they couldn't find their way um, as well. And then there was some, something, I can't remember now, I think it was like, shortwave UV light that was activating the uh, wow. compass and kind of the interaction between those two things kind of helping them find their way uh, kind of through this central flyway down through Texas. Once they get down to Texas, I guess there's a, a central path for the eastern monarchs, the east of the Rockies. There's a whole separate thing going on west of the Rockies that I know much less about. Um, uh, do you know if the, do the western ones go down to Mexico or do they No, they, they end up in Southern California in the eucalyptus groves there. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I think someone said here, it once drove from Cambridge to Pacific Grove, California to see monarchs in October. Huh? That's fantastic. Awesome. I would give anything to do that. Um, wow, yeah. So, all right, so you're there for a couple of weeks, you know, checking, and there's a whole kind of cottage industry. Um, yeah down there yeah yeah it's definitely like um you know i mean they have the nature reserves there that are are protected but um i mean this is this is i mean we were talking earlier about the threats i mean the threats are 
there are so many. We are very good at eradicating weeds in this country. Our agricultural practices have changed. So milkweed, right? The one plant that the little caterpillars need um, yeah. used to be everywhere. And so Mark and I have actually talked about our struggles to grow this weed. Yeah. <laughs> I could I could pull in the plants that I've been growing from uh, from seed here that just keep getting munched by rabbits and all these other other predators, but um, but so they're dependent on this one plant, so that's one vulnerability. Um, and and then the chemicals that you mentioned already, and then when down in the forest, because they're so like Goldilocks with this one particular place, um, there's a lot of illegal poaching that goes on even within the reserves, um, because yeah. it's a it's an impoverished area that people are trying to live. It's a it's a real um. It's a real hard thing. Even when we, when I was out there and I was going up with uh, um, WWF researchers, was when we went up into the into the area and got to go to some of the more inaccessible areas. Um, and we met on our way up there. We ran into some of the local ranchers, and they were just like really antagonistic, and they didn't like us. They didn't like the researchers being there. Um, and there was just a lot of like needing to talk with them and so there's a there's a lot of challenges like on on every level and then you know throw climate change on top of that and then that's a uh, flight map flight behavior right yeah. that was barbara king's yeah. uh, novel that that starts exploring what happens when they start going to other places that they right that they, right yeah that's a yeah. that's a really wonderfully written book and if people yeah. have uh, checked out the flight behavior they Definitely should. I, I saw some comment on one of your posts this morning uh, by uh, a writer. Is it uh, Fagan? Is it Dave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Dan Fagan. So Dan yeah, D A N Fagan is F A G I N, and his handle is Dan Fagan N Y U. So he's a professor at N Y U. He runs the um, Science Health Environmental Reporting Program. Uh, uh, great writer, but he's been working on a book about monarch butterflies. So he posted. Oh. I don't know what his pub date is, but I know it's it's in process. Yeah, I hadn't seen it uh, listed, so I, I figured it might still be in, in the pipeline. But yeah. uh, he wrote a an op ed uh, for the New York Times. Uh, a couple of years ago um, that I read this this morning about uh, this mine that they're trying to um, open up yeah. right next to the preserve down there. I guess yeah. even some of the mine's tunnels uh, go under the very mountains that the monarchs are overwintering in. And it's this that age-old tension, right, between the, uh, I mean, there's real poverty and, and people that, you know, really need, you know, they need, need to work and they need to subsist. Um, and at the same time, this these extractive industries that you know seem like a good thing at least for a while, uh, and then but it's it's hard to kind of, they're always at, at yeah. kind of cross purposes with with conservation so much so much of the time, and it's like we want the mine, but the mine will probably only be there for X number of years, and then then the butterflies will be gone, and then the mine will also perhaps poison the landscape after they've gone, and you know so it's there's a lot going on there. Yeah, there is. And, and, and everywhere. I mean, that was, that was the huge driving question of my book and really yes. like what I've been thinking about for all of my <laughs> work is just, you know, like how, you know, we want everybody to live these richer um, lives where they have all their basic resources and needs met. Um, but it is a finite planet. So I'll, I'll, I'll do the spoiler alert where the end of the book I talk about, we need to tap into like bottomless, sustainable, renewable resources, and then we can get those, those things that we feel like we need to live. Um, well, we all need to put milkweed on our roofs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can we just talk a second about how how hard that stuff is to grow? I mean, for those of you that have seen milkweed, and, and like Mira was saying, a lot of uh, butterflies and a lot of insects are, uh, there are some generalists that can eat a bunch of different um Plants, but for them, a lot of them are incredibly specific, only limited to to several species of, of host plant. And this milkweed, you've probably seen the pods, um, the seed pods. Oh wait, I might have some. You, <laughs> I've got some outside, but I can't. I, I can't leave to go get them. Wait, I just happened to be in my sunroom slash gardening room. Uh, oh, there it is! Wow. You came prepared for monarchology. I, I didn't. They've been sitting in the corner forever. I planted a bunch, and the rabbits ate them, and these I still have. Yeah. Could yeah. they make all this? Like, this is how they move, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. They will now be in my hair and mouth. And 
Yeah, they'll be <laughs> everywhere. I mean, I've play, I I would just take those off. Some a neighbor uh, had them um, around the corner, and they would just kind of grab grab a seed pod every now and then, and kind of tear it apart and, and bury them in the garden. And I feel like it took like maybe three or four years of this before they became established. Yeah. And now all I do is pull up, you know, milkweed. I still have probably 30 or 40 plants out there. So it's the right. first. I'm just going to keep trying. Yeah. Let's keep trying. Yeah. You guys have a good yard for it there. You could have a whole milkweed patch for sure. <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah. I know. Too many bunnies. I mean, you have in your work, you know, there's been, Condors in India and monarchs in Mexico. I mean, the work of an environmental journalist, you know, will kind of uh, encourage or feed a certain amount of restlessness. But do you, you've also done work kind of closer to home, right? Like, are you always looking in your backyard for kind of where the next story is coming from? Yeah, well, I, I guess especially these days. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was uh, vultures in India, and I was supposed to be heading to back to India this this fall to keep uh reporting on them so that's that's not happening so yeah it is about finding I mean but this is this is something that like I encourage with like thinking about travel writing even separate from environmental writing is just how to bring like how to bring the traveler's eye to our own home places and I think there's something kind of interesting about this moment of like seeing our our home places in a slightly different way um and and I, I think we should embrace that. You know, we, we can't do anything about it, but just embrace that and try to use it to like have this new lens about what your place is and what it can be. Absolutely. I mean the notion of the notion of traveling and, and touring, you know, I've been I've been touring yeah. in yes. my house now for, <laughs> for I think I've played this room several times already since the beginning of the pandemic. But yeah. you know, this this notion of traveling, it's it's you can kind of just change, it's an issue of scale, right? If you if you work on a smaller scale of resolution, I know I've hammered away at this before in previous uh, ologies and essays, but you know if you if you tighten up your scale uh, to a finer scale of resolution, there's just so much detail to um, to kind of get lost in. I mean, this raising Judy. I mean, I didn't even know. I wasn't doing it consciously. I just was like, "Oh, there's a there's a monarch. I want, I want to save it." You know, I didn't even think twice about it. I brought her inside, and tending to her was this became this daily meditation. It was the first first thing I checked on every morning. How's she? She's bigger than last <laughs> night, you know. And um, every of course, everyone knows. There's these familiar things like around your house. You think you know your backyard or. or a particular room and everybody knows these things like caterpillars turn into butterflies and it's very axiomatic and if you take it at kind of face value there, there doesn't seem to be much wiggle room or, or kind of any space for mystery but when you really zero in on it I mean it's mind-blowing yeah yeah right? and, and stopping to see things up, up close is it just changes your perspective right yeah oh I mean it's it's crazy so when Judy started developing these these dark spots on, on her chrysalis, and I'm checking on her again now, she's still <laughs> she's still in there. Um, I have, have remembered reading something about this um, this protozoan uh, parasite, and I'm going to pronounce it badly here, but I think it's Ophryocystis electroscura. Right, and a protozoan is like a single celled organism, and um, and they basically. Um, need the butterflies to kind of survive and, and mate to kind of spread the, the protozoa, but they, they, they basically, the protozoa, there's maybe seven or eight of them in these little spores that are spread from the butterfly to the plants where they're right. laying eggs. And um, so these dark spots uh, on the chrysalis supposedly are one um, kind of hallmark of, you know, uh, of this uh, parasitic infection. But then I read this morning that uh, if the if the dark spots are more symmetrical than asymmetrical, then it might just be normal a normal part of the maturation process. Hmm. And um, I, you know, I've been looking at that thing. Some people have also chimed in, like it looks symmetrical to me. It's got to be symmetrical, right? You know, <laughs> the timing's right, right? In terms right. of when when she should be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in these spots, if it was the parasite, they are also supposed to. Um, kind of be visible 
right before uh, eclosion, which is another one of these kinds of uh, to eclose is to emerge from a, a pupil stage. And I've enjo really enjoyed sharing a lot of this this bug vocabulary, you know, uh, here on Instagram. You know, whether it's instar, uh, the time between you know <laughs> the, the molts of the caterpillars, or uh, or frass. Of course, everyone loves frass now. <laughs> caterpillar cage. But um, I guess I just kind of took it for granted that, you know, we all know about caterpillars turning into butterflies and we all maybe watched some of that happening as a kid. But I guess there's a, a lot of us don't do it as an adult um, and really stop to think about it. You know, when they, when they pupate, when they're in that chrysalis, their entire body is dissolving. As I understand it, it's like if you were to open that up at, at a, at a particular point, it would be like caterpillar soup. It would be basically yeah. liquid. And there's these, um, and I knew I was going to forget the names of the cells, but there's these these certain types of cells that the caterpillars have that they carry with them um, all through their caterpillar stage, and then those cells become fed by the nutrients of that uh, caterpillar soup, and then they become the different tissue of the adult, uh, mm -hmm. the adult um, animal. You know, so they've got this, this group of cells that become uh, wing, you know, wings and legs, you know, and, and it's just it's Amazing. fascinating. And, you yeah. know, if that's happening, I mean, there's thousands or millions right right in my yard. Most of them I'll never even see. And to be surrounded by that kind of uh, mm -hmm. miracle uh, even, and not have to even travel for it, it's just there. Uh, right. For you to kind of witness if you if you take the time to me that is yeah, that's just a beautiful thing and, and that's what i love about your writing too like i've never been to india i would love to go someday but like the, the great nature writers the great travel writers they they highlight the individuality of a place but there's also this um kind of establishment of common ground i guess for lack of a better way of putting it it's like you have to see yourself yeah in in that place, despite its uniqueness and its difference from yours, and to kind of gauge that distance is, is, is where the interest is. Right, right. Find that, find, like look for what's familiar and then find, because there's always something familiar, right? So like figuring out what that is and identifying it, as opposed to just, I think it's easy for us to think, oh, this is an exotic, faraway place when we go to places that are unfamiliar to us, but people are people. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's wild. Well, I would I would suggest that everybody um, uh, pick up a copy of uh, of A River Runs Again. And uh, what is the name of that um, the the travel writers collection that it's called Be Best Women's Travel Writing. This one was in volume eight, but this was back in 2012, and it's been coming out every year for for years. So it's a whole whole series i guess this is backwards but it's the yep. best women's travel writing series yep. and it, it comes out the publisher's traveler's tales all right and yeah. our friend lavinia um spalding uh, edited that one. does she edit all of them she's edited a whole bunch of them i'm not sure you know it's just year to year they do change editors um over but she's she's done them for a handful of years definitely okay yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well and we'll be on the lookout for um for dan fagan's book too and uh and again flight behavior um, I will surely keep everyone updated on Judy's progress. There, there's, I'm hoping sometime this week, uh, she, she went into her chrysalis uh, a week ago this past Sunday, and I, as, as far as I can tell, it's like 8 to 14 days in there, so we're on day whatever, uh, 9. Yeah. So uh, it's coming. And yeah. We, we pray for Judy's health. <laughs> Yeah, and are you are you uh, are is there music coming from this? Are are you seeing new uh, new new things in your own? You know, I don't know if there's music coming specifically from this, but one of the things that is that I've that I've kind of admitted to in the past is that it, the skills that you get from uh, observing and for paying attention to that kind of those details and. Um, and also the repetition, just the daily work of getting new milkweed leaves, and cleaning out the frass, you know, like just making sure everything is okay, the, the kind of routine. Um, that kind of routine and behavior married with um, fine observation, I mean, that 
that will eventually lead to some kind of song. I don't know if yeah. it's going to be a butterfly song or not. But um, in fact, I do have a song on um, my, uh, someone here is mentioning uh, for, for a song uh, record. And uh, there's a song in there called The End of the Day. Uh, and there's a, a line in there that says, the monarchs go to Mexico. How do they know the way, you know? And I think that the um, line after that is, uh, each question leads to more mysteries at the end of the day. And, to me, that's that's where the inspiration for the for songs is, and for, and for writing is. is It's not necessarily in the specifics of any one thing, um, though. Those are a wonder to kind of hold up to the light for every once in a while. Yeah, more of this the skill set, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think that's. I mean, that's what I, I love about your music is that you have this all these other interests, you know, and that just like that comes that comes across so strongly. Um, it just, it, I mean, it's the same thing with writer. Like the more, the more a writer is doing so many other things besides just the one thing that's supposedly in front of you. Um, yeah. Cause it is, like you said in the beginning, it is all related. You find that was like, I was teaching this spring and my task with the students was every, when they'd walk into class each week, I'd be like, okay, what did you hear or learn or have a conversation or what happened in the past week that related to something here that you, you thought would have nothing to do with this? Like oh, I'm taking class and, and this totally unrelated. I'm taking an art class. Okay. What does that have to do with this climate change class? Like just trying to make those connections. is so yeah. it's like where the really rich stuff is. Yeah, do you, did you ever read, there's a book by E.O. Wilson, uh, the famous sociobiologist E.O. Wilson, that yeah. talked, there's a word for it that he uses, and I can't remember what it, what it was, but it, it's, a, it's a book about, uh, uh, I haven't read it, but. <laughs> not, not biophilia. No, but, no, uh, it's not more, biophilia. But it's more it's about the about, connections. About the connections between all the different disciplines mm. and the ways of knowing and how, you know, the, you know biology might not be. So different from yeah. the humanities or you know stuff like that um, I obviously I need to read the book but um, I think that's something that I think that's where the real kind of interesting stuff is the real again like realizing the the commonalities and what we share and what we and what makes you know what makes us also unique when I was starting out I mean I had just come out of graduate school for for uh, evolutionary biology and studying insect population dynamics. And, you know, at the time, guys like Steve Earle, you know, were huge. And, like, here I was with my master's degree in evolutionary biology. And it was like, how, why would we use this to, to you know, let people know about my music? Like, I'm writing, I'm writing these, like, rootsy folk rock songs. Like, I want to be like Steve Earle, except I'm... <laughs> I don't have any of his, you know, lifestyle kind of, uh, you know, qualifications on my own person. And so it took a while to kind of not run from that, you know. And like, it's great to hear you say, like, it's interesting to see all these different things you're kind of interested in. Because for a long time, I just kind of put them over to the side. It was like, no, I'm a musician, you know, right, That's right. what I do. But really, they all inform it. And it's kind of useless yeah. to run away from it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I did this. I did the same thing for a long time before I realized like that was where the interesting stuff came out of was that you just see something in some different way. And like t thinking about, you know, seeing things that are so close to you, like also just your own, your own life experience. You know, we're just so like, oh, that's just, that's just my world. Like, how do you figure out how to like step out of it and look at what, how your experience means that you have a view that nobody else nobody else might have so yeah out what to do that channel that yeah and, and vice versa too like i've been astonished the times when i i've shared something that i thought you know was just very arcane and individual only to me and then you know other people pop pop up you know i, yeah. I had the same thing you know even judy i mean i've got several several fans <laughs> and followers here on instagram that are now raising their own Monarch caterpillars. It's like it's, it's crazy how this stuff that you feel is is so kind of unique and and kind of specific to you can actually be shared by other people and it brings everybody right. close to the time when we're also you know isolated. It's like yeah, I think this has been a real kind of window into how to um, pay attention to something that 
is known, like the progression, you know, from cat egg to caterpillar to right. Christmas to, to butterflies is known, and yet to to kind of drill down on it and focus on it intently makes it no less miraculous. And yeah. we kind of all see it in our own backyard. It's it's uh I thought I was just raising a butterfly. What about <laughs> <laughs> So true. Uh, Just don't, 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 people don't go out and like buy uh, butterfly larvae on Amazon or something because apparently the ones that are reared, they know it's really popular to like let them go at weddings and stuff like that. But my understanding is that those uh, laboratory raised ones are not, they don't behave the same in the wild. And it like, sounds like you should go out, find, find your local milkweed patch and start yeah. <laughs> flipping up yeah. leaves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, you go back and forth between like encouraging people to go out and collect right. stuff, <laughs> nature, take it out of nature into your home. But at the same time, there can be real, I mean, I'll never look at a monarch um, or a milkweed the same way again. And I was already keyed into it, uh, maybe more than, than some people. Yeah. So um, there is, I think, real kind of educational value when you can interact with nature in a way that it, it really changes you fundamentally and maybe you can better be an advocate and an educator and help you know, kind of yeah advocate for it a little bit better so maybe there's maybe there's a reason a good reason to take take a caterpillar every now and then <laughs> i'm gonna put her back as soon as she, she comes out she's, she's she, still in there she will go yeah. yeah and then she'll just do i mean she'll just carry on right she's gonna head to freaking Mexico, and she's and and if there's a hurricane, she can actually fly through it. Though she weighs the same as a penny, like they are absolutely, absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, it really is. It really is astounding. Yeah, yeah. I've done a, a lot of traveling and seen a lot of. Been very fortunate to see a lot of amazing things, but I feel like that um, experience down there was really one of the highlights of just that many living breathing creatures like that are so mysterious to us and show us how little we actually really know <laughs> and try and remember how little we know um yeah yeah you know that's such a, that's a really good thing to end on here like the the study of nature i mean i think a lot of people think of biologists and scientists as studying nature and kind of being very cold and clinical and kind of knowing all about it and taking all the mystery out of it. And when I think in reality, it, it's one of those situations where the more you, the more you know, the more you realize that you don't know. Yeah. It's kind of very humbling and um, yeah. kind of awe inspiring uh, kind of practice. And I think, I think we'd be better off if uh, more people did it. And, yeah. Uh, and then paid attention to it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm seeing a comment here that uh, Casey Musgraves, a wonderful singer-songwriter, Casey Musgraves, has a song called Butterflies that seems appropriate for this apology. <laughs> so that's a great idea. I'm going to go listen to some Casey Musgraves. <laughs> and I'll let you get on with your day. And I just wanted to thank you. It's great to see you again. I just saw you last weekend, but it's good to it's see you again. still great to see you. And <laughs> thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And, Mark, a pleasure to talk about Monarchs with you anytime. I'll talk All right. Us. We'll do it again. All right. <laughs> thanks, Mira. Bye, everyone. Bye.